a little. Um, we've just seen how the rain does to us humans <laughs> when we don't have enough shelter, and that is exactly the case with our women and children. Millions of people there, whether in Darfur or in neighboring countries like Chad, you know all about this stuff. We need to put an end to that, and we can only accomplish that through the help of the whole human family, people like yourselves. I have lost um, uh, trust in politicians a long time ago. Especially, I grew, I was born and grew up in Sudan, and most of our problems. Uh, where and still are caused by politicians. But people like Congressman McGovern and other people here I, I happen to meet in this country have made me to change my mind. And through their help, I think we are getting somewhere. We are getting, an, we are putting an end to this genocide. Luckily, a few weeks ago, we have had the good news from the ICC, the International Criminal Court. And that is only the beginning. Uh, of the very long, long, long road to put an end to the genocide. I am sure every one of you is going to just to do that part, that small part in this huge quilt to put the end to the genocide. And thank you very much. Panther, would you mind saying a few words for us as well? Oh, sure. Um, Panther is also from Sudan. Um, he is from the southern region, um, and he just attended Brandeis University, where he graduated with honors, which is really amazing to me, after undergraduate school, and then went on to graduate school, and now wants to help third, third world countries um, with economic growth. I want to first uh, start by thanking all of you, uh, thank Rachel and Congressman McGovern. Uh, it's nice meeting you. And I appreciate all the efforts uh, by people in Worcester and all around the state and uh, all around the country. Um, uh, like Rachel mentioned before, uh, I am from the south of the Sudan and, uh, well, a victim of uh, of uh, the war that was never known in the war, but a war that, war that had a war that had taken about two million lives, uh, a war that has uh, displaced over four million people, and a war that has lasted, um, I, I should say, uh, for half a century now, since uh, '55, uh, when uh, Sudan. Um, was about to get its independence from the rule uh, you know, when, when the British colonized us and we wanted to get independence. But then the British, uh, when they were leaving, they left uh, the whole uh, gov governing of the country in the hand of the few uh, individuals in the north, the Arabs in the north. But uh, people in the south were not happy about it, so they started revolving already and um, and that lasted for about 17 years before they came back to peace agreement that was signed in 72 and that peace agreement gave a South Sudan a self-autonomous government and also took away uh, the law that was instituted by the Arab in the north called the Sharia law, the religious law and, and Sudan became a secular country for the first time. Uh, that lasted for about 10 years uh, before the same government that signed peace came back and really repealed all that agreement that was signed. And that really started another war in 83. Uh, the war that, that, uh, became, that came to the close in 2005. But I, you know, the reason I keep going back to that is to give you a sense of what has been going on in my country and why I'm here. So that war in 83 that started then was between the army, you know, from the south and the army from the north. And so, you know, I was growing up there knowing there was war. But then when the northern government realized that, you know, you can
cannot find the army in the south unless you get to the people. You know, the people who have the army, you have to, you know, attack them. Uh, like what is happening now in Darfur. So uh, my village for the first time in 87, four years after the civil war started, came under attack, was burned down, my life was at risk, and so many other people, uh, young people then, and uh, I, 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 I was playing nearby the uh, outcasts of the village, and then we ran, you know, from the sound of the gun. You know, and we ran, people were running everywhere in different directions. And we were, we just, we ch ch children, I was about 10 years old, did not know what to do. And elders came, who were also running, and collected us together, told us to be quiet because if you are crying, that's how your enemy hear you, and they are going to run after you. So we kept silent. And they also told us we will be going back to our villages. That never happened. That started my journey. And the one that later on been be known by the world as uh, um, the Lost Boys of Sudan journey. And that's how I was part of that. I, we fled towards Ethiopia uh, with the uh, Arabs following us, the government bombing, and the animal at night, you know, just that was just coming to an end, you know, from that experience. But luckily, you know, luckily I survived, so many others survived. I ended up in Ethiopia. We were told it was safe now. You know, there is something called international agreement uh, that stopped, you know, the Sudanese from following us into, the, into Sudan. And we, you know, although I agreed to it reluctantly, it was true, we were not, never attacked. But the life there started really very strange. You know, uh, we had no parents, we started having traumas, you know, children were dying from diseases, food, there was no food, and life was just difficult. And we managed for another four years, and war started in Ethiopia. We had to run back again, and there wasn't any better in Sudan, so we ran to northern Kenya and lived in a refugee camp under hot condition, dusty, you know, condition, little food for about nine years before the U.S. government accepted us to come to the country uh, in 2001. And I came here, uh, when I came here in 2001, uh, I, I started talking to people and they were telling me they did not know about what was going on in Sudan. That really struck the thought. I, I, I took it as an initiative to tell people what was going on, and I became a, a, an activist. Uh, but I also wanted to go to school to, in order to do that effectively. So I went to uh, UMass Boston. Um, I'm actually still a graduate student at Brandeis. I haven't graduated yet, but I, I have, I'm done with classes. I'm starting to work. Uh, it's a requirement that I need to do so that I graduate next year. But I'm telling you all these, uh, you know, stories because I want to put you in, in, in the picture of people that are in Darfur right now, or people in Chad and people in other neighboring countries that are running, that are in my situation. Some of them with the potential that I have. Some of them who never made it uh, to life, and those who are yet to die. And so, you know, we all have a human potential, and we all have the right to live. But, you know, when a government like government of Sudan decided, you know, uh, to choose who to die and who to leave, uh, and we just sit there watch them doing it, it's not ethical and it's not morally right. And therefore, that's one of the reasons I am always in these events to tell people that, you know, it's our effort to do so, to help those who are in need at this moment in Darfur. Thank you for coming.